All righty, welcome everyone. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Jonathan Gonzalez Montelongo. I use he, him pronouns, and I am your visitor services and events coordinator in our campus tours and visitor center. Um, I work for the orientation and transition programs team. So helping you transition as you help, as you transition into college um, programs like this is what's gonna help you kind of make that transition. So if you have any questions about any of our Coyotes Connect programming, I'm your guy. I will leave your, um, my contact information in the chat, um, but I don't wanna take away from any of the programming today. I'm gonna hand it over to Olga Valdivia, who's part of our College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and enjoy the program today. I will be in the background, um, just making sure everything goes well. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, we're excited to welcome you and uh, show you a little bit of what we have to offer in our college. So um, we always say we are the college, right? And uh, we are such a dynamic college. And once I introduce you to some of our guests here, you will see why. Um, we have a lot of programs to offer, a lot of resources to offer students. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to now uh, bring in our, let me just tell you who, who all we're welcoming today. One second. All right. So uh, first off, we're going to have uh, our dean, uh, Rafiq Mohammed. He's going to talk a little bit about the college. Then we'll, we'll have uh, Dr. Grisham from the Department of De geography, sorry about that. Uh, and he's going to give us a presentation. After that, we have uh, one of our students, Fernando Sanchez, who's going to talk about his experience as a, as a student at the university, within the college, and more specifically, give you information about the Mellon Mays program um, and his experience with that. I am Olga Valdivia, and uh, we also have Stephanie Loera in the background. She's going to help answer questions. If you have any questions in the chat, Feel free to put them out there. And so with that, here we go. Do we have our Dean with us? Here he is. All right, oh. I'm on mute. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, thank you, Olga. and Thank you, Jonathan. And welcome, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. In fact, I, I was just in a meeting with my boss, uh, and, I, and I cut her off and said, I've got to go because I got I to gotta give a welcome introduction to some fine folks uh, over in, in another Zoom room. So um, ordinarily, you know, this is something we'd be doing in person. And I, I, I would love to see your faces and be able to kind of stay here and ask, like answer questions that you had and everything else. I, I draw my energy from, uh, from, from being able to interact with y'all. But, uh, you know, Zoom is going to have to do it right now. But I did want to, Olga invited me. Uh, to just say a few words about the college and to welcome you, uh, to welcome you all today, and I'm I'm thrilled to do that. And I know that they have a great program set up for you today, where you can learn more about uh, specific activities and opportunities that the college uh, has to offer. And as Olga said, yes, we are the college. All right, you know, there are other colleges on campus, but we are the college, and by that I mean we're the best. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah, all right, all of our colleges on this campus are great, but I do like I do take particular pride in our college. Uh, we have the highest graduation rates on campus. We graduate more than tw twice as uh, many students from the College of Social Behavioral Sciences than any other college on campus. Uh, we have lots of uh, just we, all of our faculty are outstanding and caring and attentive. Uh, and, and, and we have lots of other opportunities for you to really kind of get your hands dirty and do all you need to do to succeed here at CSUSB uh, and particularly in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Um, as you can see from this slide here, social, behavior, social and behavioral sciences uh, is, a, is a, it casts a kind of wide net with respect to uh, the disciplines that you can explore in the college. Uh, and, and we encourage you to take a close look at each of these and really kind of find your groove. Before I tell you about these specific disciplines, I will say this. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been in higher ed for a long time. And consistently, I have found that um, you know, obviously people come to college and they're thinking, I want a degree so I can get a job and I need my degree so I can go on to graduate school or medical school or whatever the case is. And, and I will say that the, the thing that I found to be most consistent is that if you pursue your passion, whatever that may be, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, studying uh, people, studying places, uh, you know, studying languages, whatever it is, if you pursue what you love, if you study what you love, if you study what really interests you, that's where you're most likely to be successful. And that will open doors for you in terms of what you want to do next. 
in fact, I had a meeting earlier today and a meeting yesterday in two separate meetings, two completely different contexts. And they were talking about uh, what employers were looking for, uh, whether it be in, uh, in in conventional industry or even in like anthropological settings, because I had a meeting today with anthropology. And, and they were talking about, you know, employers will train you to do specific jobs that they need you to do, but they want people who are critical thinkers, who can write well, who can communicate well, and who can engage with people and who understand diversity. And that's really what the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences is all about. Those are just some of the skills that you pick up in the disciplines in this college and, and, and in other colleges on campus, uh, to, to be sure. Uh, but just in terms of the majors, we have everything, as you can see here, from uh, anthropology to criminal justice to economics to geography and environmental studies to history to political science to psychology, child development, so, uh, sociology, my home discipline, uh, and, and we have a bachelor's degree in social sciences, we have social work, uh, and lots of different subfields in there. So I really encourage you, you know, from today and forward to really explore where you see yourself fitting in, what you really want to study, what questions you have about life and society, and make that your guide in terms of choosing a discipline as you uh, embark on this journey called college. Um, uh, again, we have great advisors who can help you make these choices, and uh, I know Dr. Grisham is here with you today. He's one of our department chairs, but we also, each of the departments that we have in the college has uh, department chairs and faculty who would be more than happy to answer questions that you may have about those specific disciplines, uh, along with the advisors and other folks. In addition to what the specific, in, in your specific uh, area of study, we have tons of other opportunities for you to really engage. One of the things I encourage every student coming to college to do, aside from studying what they love, um, again, because that's where you'll find the greatest success and fulfillment, is also to take advantage of other things, other opportunities that exist on campus. And so here at CSUSB, I mean, we have scholarships to, to help you kind of you know, pay for things, but we also have tons of hands-on research experience. We have study abroad and study away opportunities. Some of our classes, so for example, in Dr. Grisham's department, uh, you know, some of the classes in geography actually have field research components where you go out into the desert for a few days with the professor and, and you see the landscape in a way that you never would have seen it before. Uh, we have lots of opportunities to meet with practitioners in the field through things like career fairs uh, and, and, and internships and, and externships. Uh, we also have lots of clubs and organizations. I think every major in our college, every department in our college has a club and an honor society associated, associated with it. And I really, again, encourage you to kind of think about these opportunities as ways to kind of more deeply engage with your studies, because that's one of the keys to success. The more you engage in one of these, in, in these high impact practices, the more you get connected to your peers and your faculty and to the overall experience, the more likely you are to succeed, not just here as a student, but as you uh, leave here as a graduate and go on to do uh, other great things. Um, we also have great advisors, uh, both in terms of our professional advisors, like, uh, like Olga and Stephanie, uh, but we and we also have peer advisors and peer networks to really kind of help you. So people that who who've been where you've been, who can tell you how they got through certain things. And and lastly, we have uh, student support through uh, things like, uh, like like tutoring. So we have a statistics lab uh, where if you're taking a statistics class in social and behavioral sciences, regardless of what uh, department you're in, we have uh, trained professionals to help you kind of really understand uh, and succeed in statistics. And we also have a writing lab to help you to help re review papers before you submit them and things like that uh, to ensure that you're, again, learning the most you can and getting the most support uh, that you can through this whole experience. So I know we, we have a, a time limit and anybody here that knows me knows that I could run my mouth forever about uh, how much I, I, I love our college, but I did just want to once again welcome you all uh, and, and, and uh, if you have questions, there are great people here that you can ask and otherwise I just wish you a, a, a great success and a safe uh, uh, end to this COVID pandemic and, 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 a, and a prosperous future. And now I'm going to go run back to my meeting with my boss. Maybe she doesn't know that I'm gone, but thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. We really appreciate you being here. Awesome. So next, uh, next on the program is going to be Dr. Grisham. Um, feel free to boot me off the screen share. I'll do that in just a second, Olga. How about that? Um, well, welcome first and foremost to all of you. Um, I, I will I will start this by saying I'm a proud coyote. Uh, I'm actually an alumnus of our campus. I got our degree from our the college. My degree actually BA was in criminal justice uh, way back in the day, so to speak. 
Um, but the college uh, that we have now is just as good, if not better than it was when I went to school there. And there's even more opportunities. So I would echo everything uh, my boss just said, um, because he's absolutely correct. And I can tell you that the things I've gotten to do in my life, uh, working with heads of state, working at the United Nations, things like that were all because of the, of the experience I had at Cal State San Bernardino. Um, as, uh, before I segue, I will say I came to the campus as a transfer student in the early 1990s, so probably before some of you were even born, which makes me feel older and older as the years go on. Um, but I came in as a transfer student, first generation student, first in my family to have a college degree, didn't really know what I was doing. And it's really because of our campus uh, that I was, uh, that, you know, really I was able to succeed. And when I had the opportunity 12 years ago to come back to the campus and take over the program that I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that and the campus that I really have called home since the time I walked onto campus, um, it, it's by far the best decision I ever made. Uh, I used to tell students in these settings that uh, to be honest, when I applied to Cal State San Bernardino, it wasn't my first choice, but it is by far the best choice I ever made in my entire life. Um, so I, I hope you'll feel the same way. Um, so I believe, let me share my screen now with you because nobody wants to see my face for the next few minutes. Um, let me see here. Okay. Whoop. What happened there? Is that good there, Olga and Jonathan? Olga, you might need to stop sharing yours. Okay, let's try that again. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, hold on one second. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Okay, is that any better there? Yes, we can Perfect. see. Okay, um, so uh, I, I serve as the Dean and Olga suggested, I serve in many, many different roles. This is not even the list of everything I do at the campus, uh, but I just listed a thing. So I, I currently serve as, as I said earlier, my name is Dr. Kevin Grisham, um, and I currently serve as the department chair and uh, the professor of global studies. Uh, we only have one professor of global studies on campus currently, and that's me. Um, so for those of you that are interested in global studies, I'm the person you talk to, but also global studies is housed within my department. Um, I also serve as our coordinator for our master's program and an equivalent, the Social Science and Globalization MA. And of course, what I'll be talking about today is I've served for the last 12 years as the coordinator for the Model UN program. And as I said earlier, I'm an alumnus of the program that I currently run, uh, as well as the campus itself. So what I wanted to talk a little bit about in, in the sense of our program was talk about um, what is CSUSB model United Nations. Um, we actually have a phrase that we adopted a few years ago, which is explore the world, become part of a legacy. This is our 44th year in existence. We're one of the oldest collegiate model UN programs in the world. I believe there's only about six other programs that are older than us, um, but we are by far one of the most successful. And I'm not just saying that the statistics actually prove that to be true. Um, so what is model United Nations? So. Um, regardless of what your major is, I should say that just, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute about, you know, when you're in college, it's not simply just getting your degree and, and learning the content from your major. It's also developing soft skills. Um, it's something I'm teaching a senior seminar this term. And it's one of the things I talked to, I was just talking to my students on Monday night about that it's really important to build your soft skills in writing and public speaking uh, and analytical work, regardless of what your major is, because that's really what's going to help you uh, after you leave us both in graduate programs after you leave, but also just for jobs. Um, and so Model UN does that. It is a high impact practice program. Um, and so it basically simulates the inner workings of the United Nations and all its related bodies. Um, so every year, um, and actually in our case, twice a year, our college is assigned by National Model UN, which is a non-governmental organization at the United Nations, a country to represent uh, at one of their conferences. And so we represent a country. So for example, right now, even in this virtual environment, uh, we actually are participating in the New York conference again this spring. It'll be completely virtual, but we actually do have a team that's representing uh, Mexico um, actually at the conference this year. And this will be our second time around. The first time around is pictured here with 
uh, with two of our colleagues who actually were on that team two years ago when we represented. And they're actually sitting at the real desk at the United Nations where the diplomats in Mexico represent uh, that country at the United Nations. And so you basically prepare in and outside of class to be diplomats from that assigned country. So you learn about the country, you learn about the culture of the country, uh, you learn about everything you possibly can about the country, including its positions on various international issues. And then you go to the conference and you represent that country as if you were a diplomat. And so our entire delegation this year is Mexico. Uh, we had a delegation last year that pre-COVID was supposed to be representing Ecuador. And of course, because of COVID, the conference was uh, canceled. Um, but then in the fall of last year, fall of two, uh, 2019, we took a team to Germany. So now twice a year, we actually travel um, to, uh, we actually travel to the um, various sites where National Model UN is actually held. And so every fall, we take a team internationally. Um, and so I've taken teams to uh, students from our campus to South Korea, to Canada, to the Czech Republic, and to most recently Germany. Uh, next year, we'll be going back to the Czech Republic, hopefully, as long as everything allows us to travel again. Um, and then every spring for 44 years, we've been traveling to New York City, uh, right around the corner from the United Nations and actually participating in what is the oldest and largest Model UN conference in the world for colleges and universities, and that is National Model UN. And so there are awards given to the delegation of how well you present that delegation in public speaking and writing and her personal skills. And for the last 30 years of our program, we've won 28 outstanding, which is the top international prize. So we are by far just based on data alone, the, uh, the one of the oldest and one of the most successful programs in the world. And all of that, of course, is right at your university at CSUSB. Um, how that relates to classes is that you can take the classes regardless of what major you're in. Um, starting under the semester system, when we switch the semester systems this year, um, the policies are now is that you have to uh, enroll in Geography 5150, which is global governance in the UN system either while you're on the team the first time or prior to taking the team. So I teach the class in the fall. And then my co-advisor, uh, Professor Sina Bastami, who's also an alumnus of the program and who is one of my former students, um, runs the program in, uh, teaches the class in the spring. And in fact, he's actually running the program this term uh, that's gonna be purchasing virtually in New York. Um, that class, by the way, counts as an upper division social science GE class. So it's a way to participate, get some more knowledge, but at the same time, build towards graduation. It's open to pretty much any students, regardless of major for that class, because it is an open GE class and there are no prerequisites for it. So we have everything from freshmen all the way to seniors taking that class. If you're on the team, then depending on what term you're in, you would register in one of the two classes you see listed here. Um, starting this coming fall, 5755 will be a study abroad experience on top of that. Um, so there's actually a way for you to tap into financial aid and other resources on our campus to help pay if you're on that team, they'll be going to the Czech Republic. And so next year will be, to, uh, fall will be hopefully going to the Czech Republic. The year after that, it'll be Japan, Kyoto, uh, Japan. And the year after that, we will be back in Germany. So we actually already know ahead of time. And of course, very similarly, um, there's a class in the fall. For some majors, by the way, that counts. So if you're doing global studies, for example, we have a new BA in global studies on our campus um, that just started this year. It's one of only five in the state of California. And um, that actually counts towards that major. If you're environmental studies or geography, it counts towards that major. And most other majors on our campus, particularly within C uh, the College of Social Variable Sciences, most of my colleagues will count it for most of your degrees as a class. Um, Real simple to apply. It is a competitive examination process to get into the program. Um, these are some of the beautiful faces of some of your, uh, from some alumni of our campus. Uh, in fact, this was in South Korea and this group was actually in Canada uh, from a few years ago. Um, all majors, all educations can apply, freshmen to graduate students. Um, it's an online application process. There's a interest exam, which is basically full 50 multiple choice questions. It covers a wide range of issues. Um, and it's really to get a baseline of how you compare to other candidates. Um, it is not something necessarily that you're gonna be able to ace, but it is a way to sort of give us an idea of uh, how much preparation you have or understanding the world around you. And then those who make it beyond this first stage of the application exam process, then they move into 
um, doing panel interviews. So this process, by the way, is very similar for when you're applying for jobs to become a US diplomat or most diplomats around the world. Um, so what do you gain from it? Well, you gain, uh, I, there's, there's a great video, but I know it won't work necessarily in the streaming year, um, but I recommend going on the CSUSB website and just uh, looking for our model, our model UN website and also the, the YouTube uh, channel for CSUSB because there's some great videos have been done and testimonials by students, uh, one of which is actually in the full scholarship right now, Law School, University of San Diego. Um, but just to give you just a snippet of 44 years, and they wouldn't fit all on one slide, this is just some of the people and what they're doing after they graduated from our campus from a wide range of majors. Um, you, you basically build a large amount of skill set, what we call 21st century skills. And so what that ends up in is sort of what you see before you. Um, I'll highlight a few. Uh, most recently, Ms. Sandy Naranjo, um, who was on my team the very first year I came to the campus in the first two years, just became the first uh, Latina to be appointed as commissioner for the Board of uh, Port Commissioners for the Port of San Diego. Uh, Donovan Rinker Morris was one of the very first from our campus to get into Harvard Law School, and now he's a very successful lawyer. And so we have people working at Walt Disney, uh, the Walt Disney Company, people are lawyers, uh, people are doing their PhDs and teaching elsewhere. And as you can see just from here, they work around the United States, around the world. Uh, we have a, even a lot of international students who did our program who are now uh, working and serving overseas in places like Japan and Germany and South Africa and um, Tunisia. So uh, it really is the who's who of sort of the excellence of our campus who've been part of this uh, program. Um, so what I would recommend, and I'll just wrap up with this because I want to take time from my colleagues who are going to be presenting is um, feel free to drop me an email. This is my email address here. Um, you can also give me a call on this uh, phone. This is my office phone, but it does uh, reach me at home um, or on Twitter or on our website. If you reach out to me and want to know more about the program, feel free to let us know and then we'll let you know how you can apply to be a part of the program uh, to move into next year. And that's it for me. Alrighty, thank you so much. You know, every time that I attend one of these events, I'm still learning so much about all the different opportunities we have uh, because there's so many of them, right? So thank you so much, Dr. Grisham. Really appreciate that. Now, if we, if we can have Fernando uh, talk to us about his experience as a student and as a Mellon May Scholar. Take it away. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Um, I just want to re reiterate a lot of what the professor said. Um, Cal State San Bernardino is an incredible school to go to, um, especially if you're a history major. I am a history major, so that has been my experience. And all of the faculty are very, very helpful and um, very dedicated to the students, I would say. Uh, and we also have a lot of opportunities for history majors. One of the best, um, I'll get to the Mellon Maze in a bit, but one of the other best opportunities is writing for History in the Making, which is the research journal that we have on campus. It's award-winning. It won um, first prize in the Geraldine Ash uh, National um, Competition for, I believe, not just undergrads, but also graduate school journals. And I had the opportunity to write for it and be the um, chief editor. And it's a lot of fun, whether you're writing for it. Um, there is an application process where you submit your um, writing piece. It can be a journal in memoriam, um, it covers a wide range of topics. And then there's also, again, an application process if you want to be an editor, which is also an incredible experience. So that's one of the many opportunities. Um, it's run, or the uh, faculty advisor is uh, Dr. Jeremy Murray. He does Chinese history and he's a wonderful faculty member. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. And he's always so enthusiastic and happy to talk to students. Um, like I said, um, I've taken almost all of the history classes at CSUSB at this point. And every single time I'm just blown away at how incredible the professors are and how knowledgeable and helpful they are towards their students. Um, I've also had the incredible honor of being a Mellon May scholar. So one of the opportunities, and it's one of the biggest for history majors, or I guess really anyone in um, social behavioral sciences is the Mellon May's undergraduate fellowship program. And what that is, is it's a two year program. So you would apply to it typically your sophomore year, and then you would be in the program for your junior and senior year. 
And what it is, is it's a program or it's a fellowship dedicated to helping students get into graduate school. And it's typically for majors like history. Um, I feel like I'm blanking on all of them, art history. I know media studies, um, comparative literature. The only thing it's not for is for the hard sciences. So, but again, you're all um, SBS students, so that's great. And it's an incre incredible opportunity because when you go into it, you, it, it essentially teaches you how to apply for grad school and prepares you for what to expect for going on to a PhD program. So halfway through my college experience, I realized that I did wanna pursue a PhD in history. And I had no idea how unprepared I was for the process or even how to apply. Luckily, one of um, the professors there, Dr. Um, Isabel Alonzo, was like, hey, you should apply to this Mellon Mays Fellowship. And she sent me the email and the application involves writing two letters. One's a personal statement and a statement of purpose. So one explaining you, who you are, your story, why you're interested in pursuing grad school. And the other is what research you're interested in looking at. Um, that doesn't have to be set in stone. A lot of people change their topics, but you have to at least have an idea of what you want to study and how you're going to go about studying it. Um, you also need to have a faculty mentor. If you don't have one selected, that's okay, but you will have to pick one. And they essentially mentor you in not just your research, but also what to expect going into grad school. And so, like I said, sorry, going back to the application, it's um, two, two, two essays you have to write, two letters of recommendation you need from a professor. So get to know your professors, talk to them, um, strike up relationships. Uh, you need to submit a CV, and I believe that's it. It's been a while since I applied, but all of the information is on the uh, Cal State San Bernardino. Just Google MMUF Cal State San Bernardino. You'll find the page. It has um, frequently asked questions, how to apply, who to get in contact with. Um, the faculty coordinator is Dr. Um, gosh, Dr. Keating, Dr. Ryan Keating. Um, he is also a wonder prof wonderful professor. He does Civil War history. He's been immensely helpful. Um, he gave us all his phone number so that we could call him at any time. And the way it works is it's a cohort system. So only four people are accepted each year and you work with your cohort and hang on, I actually have some pictures. So you work with the cohort and you're able to go to various um, conferences. So your first year during the summer, you get to go to one of the CSUs. During my year, it was at Cal State uh, Long Beach, which was a beautiful campus. You go, you go to a lot of presentations. This was one of them. Sorry, it's a bad picture. But they teach you um, how to apply to grad school, different programs available in the Mellon Maze. Because when you become a Mellon Maze Fellow, you're a Mellon Maze Fellow for life, essentially. It follows you throughout your undergrad, your graduate, and then when you become a tenured professor, which is the goal of the program, is to get you through grad school and get you into a uh, tenured uh, faculty position. So it teaches you all of that. Again, you go to many conferences. Um, you get to present your research several times. So at the first um, at the first summer, you present your research. It's I believe one month where you go through the process. You meet all of the different cohorts. So it's not just your cohort. Um, when you go to the summer program. It's you and then all of the other CSUSB cohorts. So you all go, you meet up, you talk, um, and it's a great experience. How do I scroll? <laughs> Sorry, give me one sec. Well, I had other pictures to show, but other things that you can do is um, when it's not COVID time, they take you to some of the campuses around California. So we got to go to UC Irvine and UCLA. We got to meet some of the professors. Um, you get to network, essentially meet other scholars. And the other thing that's really awesome about the program is it gives you money to help with your research and just help you in general. So your first and second summer, I believe you get $3,200, a stipend of um, that amount. And then during each semester, you get a stipend of um, $1,800. So it's a decent amount of money. Um, it helps you to get settled. It helps you like to buy books um, because it is, 
It's a lot of fun, but it is an intensive program. You do need to be very committed to going to grad school, which is an arduous process, but it's extremely rewarding. And like I said, the faculty mentor, um, Dr. Keating is incredible. Uh, Danielle White also is incredible. She helps run the program and it's, it's a really worthwhile um, opportunity. Again, I was fortunate enough to get into it and I actually just got accepted to UC Berkeley for their PhD program. And I'm very excited, but yeah, it's, if anyone has any questions about the Mellon Maze or any of the other history opportunities, um, feel free to ask me. And yeah, that's. that's Thank you so cool. much, Fernando. This is amazing information. And it's really beautiful because you're relating it. You've experienced it, right? And so this is, uh, a lot of the different opportunities that are available to our students. So thank you so much again, really appreciate it. Um, so now that brings us to our next uh, piece of today's presentation, which is a tour. And unfortunately, we're not in person. We wish we could be in person to meet you all. Now, um, we do have a, a video or a picture tour. And so that is what we're gonna go ahead and do next. And yes, congratulations, that is so exciting. You're going to do amazing. All right, and I will welcome. Um, this is a our campus tour tour guide, but she's also um, currently a student of the college. So um, please take it over, Jack and Guillen. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to be presenting the social and behavioral science tour today. Let me pull that up. Okay. Okay, so a little bit about myself is, hello everyone, so my name is Jackie Gin, and I'm a third year sociology major. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm about to give you guys a tour of the College of Social and Behavioral Science. So to start off, it is one of the best colleges on campus, am I right? Well, it is actually known as one of our biggest colleges on campus for the reason that it does have 14 academic departments and programs from political science to sociology to psychology, social work, anthropology, and much more. The list goes on. And another thing about the College of Social and Behavioral Science is we do have a lot of centers and institutes um, within this, this college from Project Rebound to the Center of Criminal Justice Research, to the Center of Indigenous People, much more, which is probably my favorite part of this college is we have so much to offer in terms of different departments, programs, and stuff like that. Um, we also do have an Einstein's Bagel, so whenever we're back on campus, I would definitely say to check that out. It's very um, good, and that's something to have in between classes. So the first thing I'm going to talk about on the tour is the Anthropology Museum. So the Anthropology Museum was founded in 2000, and this gallery presents expansive views of the surroundings of San Bernardino and San Gabriel Mountains. The um, museum's overall mission is to really serve as a teaching laboratory for muse museum study certificate students. With that being said, we do really try to provide that hands-on experience for students in terms of collections management, exhibition um, planning, curation, and museum administration. So that's really something we emphasize here at Cal State is really that hands-on experience for students. Another thing about the Anthropology Museum is it does provide space for presentation of exhibition that illustrates and integrates the cultural context. So we're really big on behaviors and identities here. The next thing on this tour is the large um, lecture halls. So I know I've had a few classes within these lecture halls for like some of my sociology classes. And honestly, it's a really great way to um, get involved with just students and really kind of hone into that um, lecture within your um, professor. It's really, we have like state of the art stuff. We have, as you can see, those two screens in the back for those who are in the further back. We have the big screen in the front. And it's really just, even though it's a large lecture hall, we definitely, you can tell that professors are still very interactive with their students because they're walking around. So that's what I miss most of Cal State or just coming to school, honestly. I really did like going to class and just really sitting in there and really just learning all the stuff. So hopefully we can all experience that very soon. 
Next, we have the Infant and Toddler Lab School. So the Infant and Toddler Laboratory School was founded back in 2005, and it does provide care for children's ages six to 36 months. So we do have two classrooms in which they are separate, um, separated into like age gaps. So it's like six to 17 months in one room. And then we have children from 18 to 36 months. So, and then for these classrooms or the two different classrooms, we do really want to off, we really um, emphasize on offering that outdoor environment for the children. I think it's very important that even at a young age, they are being able to experience that outdoor environment because it's very much how we do learn as we grow. And we are accredited by the National Association for Education of Young Children since 2009. So that's something exciting to know about this um, laboratory school. And my favorite part was going to class, um, we got to see the children getting pushed in the strollers. So that was always exciting to see little kids around campus. So next we have research labs. And in the research labs, we are really just emphasizing again on the hands-on experience for the students, just so they could kind of get a better grasp on what it is they kind of want to do with um, their career in the future. So in the Office of Student Research, we have Research and Creative Activity Opportunity Data Vast. So with that being said, the activities do connect students with faculties involved in a specific research, and they are um, creative activities across campus. So that's really um, something important to know if that's something you are looking into or you um, are considering doing. We do have a lot of opportunities for students to really just hone in into different, so many different research opportunities. In order to, you can just schedule an, a meeting with a Coyote Research Ambassador to help with the opportunities for you. And I think that's really important because they do um, connect you with both ambassadors and OSR staff and they are available to assist you with applying for postings. And not only that, but they do help you with opportunities off campus as well. So I think that's something really to look into and really take um, advantage of just because it is something to help us grow and learn as individuals. And studies do show that if you're conducting research with um, research and networking with both mentors and fellow students, you're really gaining that knowledge that you want in your anticipating. And you just have to look up CSU's B Research Labs and it actually gives you a lot of um, researches and it tells you what department it's under, the qualifications and what you need to do in order for the research process. And I believe that concludes the end of the tour. Again, my name is Jackie Gein and I was your tour guide today. And hopefully this was able to give you guys a nice little feel of what it is the College of Social and Behavioral Science can provide for you all. Thank you so much. That was awesome. I, I could not have given that tour. Thank you. <laughs> so um, next, oh, just one second. Okay, fantastic. So now that we have concluded the tour, this is an opportunity for you to ask any questions. We still have our uh, faculty member Kevin Grisham with us. Um, so any questions, feel free to use the raise hand uh, option and um, we are happy to help uh, in answering any questions you may have. Alicia, would you like to go first? Alicia Garcia, you're up, babe. <laughs> No? Okay, maybe not. Um, do we have any other questions? Alicia, you might just, you might need a reminder to unmute yourself. Yes. I don't yes. Know you're talking. People forget that all of the time. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So if you, if you would like to speak, yes, absolutely, we can hear you. Oh, okay. I, I was talking, but uh, okay. Um, so I was wondering that since the, the tour guide talked about the labs, is there actually an EEG, like um, part of the labs? Yes, we do have that in psychology. That was those pictures. Um, two of the three I know for sure were from psychology research labs. Um, a lot of our biopsych faculty have very hands-on equipment. There's like multi-million dollar equipment. They keep it up to date because um, our faculty, our biopsych faculty are able to secure 
quite a bit of research from, from um, the National Institute of Health. So if you, for those that are interested in bio, biopsych, which I know there was at least one student, um, if you choose that particular concentration for psychology, you have lots of opportunities to work with faculty and in their research labs. And you will definitely be hands-on. Um, a lot of our faculty that have that specialization do more rodent uh, research. So you would have to be comfortable working with rats or mice. Um, one of the pictures in there was with Dr. Adante, who was unfortunately not with us, but he did more of the human research uh, with the biopsych model. Oh, okay, got it, thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, I'm ner okay, so I'm at Victor Valley College and mine is, I got accepted to Cal State San Bernardino for a pre-psychology uh, program. But my goal is to work with um, patients with mental illnesses, like a clinical psychologist. So how do I, I know that you guys are gonna help us step-by-step by, step by um, you know, with the processing, um, but I'm I'm nervous because I've been so into the community colleges, Mount San Jacinto to Victor Valley, that I feel the university, um, I just wanna be safe. I wanna make sure that I know what I'm doing and what departments that I have to go in to pursue my degree. I'm gonna have Stephanie answer that because she is our psychology specialist. Okay. Thank yeah. you. So for that, I would say that, I mean, once you're admitted, everybody has to do orientation. And so um, you will get more information. And I know uh, we're focusing probably more on psychology just because psychology is a large, uh, one. Of, it's like the largest, I think it's still the largest uh, major on the campus. But typically we always get a lot. So I'm not gonna neglect. I know there are still people with questions with social work and sociology. So I, we will get to those. We will not leave you out. So I just wanted to mention that first of all, but I would say like, you're gonna have plenty of opportunities to receive information about the major. So like I said, your next, I mean, there's I think a couple more recruitment events that you can attend where you can get more information, but definitely want, for all of those who do pick CSUSB, which I would encourage all of you to attend, um, that you will get more information about your major specifically during orientation. In okay. addition, for those of you who, who are psychology, we do have one of our classes that everybody has to take, whether you're a first time freshman or a transfer student, it's psychology as a major. That course is really designed to give you more information about the different fields of psychology, the different career possibilities. Since many of our careers do require graduate school, it will also discuss preparing for graduate school. So it's kind of like your introduction to psychology and all okay. things that are psychology related. Um, so that's where you're gonna get a lot of information. Um, all of our faculty within the department are also very student friendly. So I would encourage for all of you, especially those of you that are thinking of doing therapy or you know careers in counseling to start making connections with our faculty because you are gonna have to go on to graduate school. And part of applying to graduate school means you're gonna have to get letters of recommendation. So in addition, I mean, I always advocate for making connections with faculty, even if you aren't thinking of going to graduate school because they can also help you navigate career fields anytime. And we can give you as professional advisors, basic information about careers, but you really wanna talk to those faculty okay. to get, you know, the guidance and everything else, because they can guide you whether it's going to graduate school or to career after you graduate, they're gonna be the ones that have more of that, you know, field knowledge and, and can give you more information about the major coursework in addition to helping you get through your classes here. Yes, and okay, and, and I appreciate that and thank you. Olga, can I can I say just one thing real quickly? Yes. Um, I, I would say to Brittany is don't be scared. Um, I <laughs> Victor Valley College when I transferred to Cal State back in the 90s. Uh -huh. and I actually, that was my first teaching gig as I taught for seven years at VVC before uh, teaching UCR and then at our campus. And I will tell you that there's a natural transition. Um, we're very student friendly at our campus. And I work, I, th I think something like 60% of the majors in my department are transfer students. Yes. And, and that's typical across our campus. And so 
when you're coming from a community college, there's just a natural nice fit into our campus right. as compared to, I had students right. at UCR that didn't necessarily always have that same experience. So I, I, I wouldn't be too scared about it. I know how it is because I've been, I've been in your shoes. Yes. <laughs> and, I was um, a psych, and I was a psych major when I transferred to Cal State, by the well, way. Well, I'll make it short and sweet. I know everybody has sociology and other majors. Um, I got my associates in humanities and social behavior in 2013. I stopped for a little bit because I was helping my husband, helping my kids. And then I went back in because I am a spouse of a veteran. So I took advantage of that benefit, but my, just like, like it says in the chat, my overall is to help people. Um, I feel like they need, they deserve a second chance and I'm not saying they probably need the help, but there's a lot of people that I, I experience um, that doctors will just write them up and have a prescription and go on to the next patient and um, they don't have the opportunity to talk to them. Um, it, it will have a brief discussion for like a month or two, depending on the situation, but they will go on to the next patient. I wanna have that relationship in the professional manner to cater to their needs, to their wants, to what, you know, what's their diagnoses. And I just wanna make a difference in somebody's life. One of the faculty I'll highly recommend, and I'm sure Stephanie agree with me, is uh, Dr. Christina Azija, because what you want to do is basically her research area and what she does for the VA. So I definitely recommend you're coming to the right place for what you want to do. Okay, and thank you, and and I apologize to everyone else. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would, yes, I would definitely agree with um, speaking with Dr. Azija. I would also say if you are getting um, GA benefits, I think you could also qualify for some of the services that our Veteran Success Center provides. Okay. And that would be they offer a lot of great resources to you as well. So um, I know, I think it's usually Jaime that helps students like navigate just because I know there's a lot of paperwork involved when you get the GI Bill. He yeah. can definitely help you with that. But I think they all, you'd also qualify some other services because I know it, Veteran Success Center provides a lot of extra help. Too. Yes. And like I said, um, I will go and do those for the, those processing steps. Um, I'm just nervous on, you know, like the different things that you have to do, you know, with the orientation. I know I have to look at the to do list and whatnot, but um, I just want to make sure I'm doing it correctly. And um, I will talk to the veteran resource if I'm saying that right. Um, I, I'm just, I'm excited, but at the same time, I'm nervous. So um, let's just see how it goes. But I, I do like to, I like the challenge. I like the, you know, I might be calm. Um, I don't overreact. Um, I feel like I'm a good candidate to help other people because my husband suffers from PTSD. I'll just put in a plug for our Coyotes Connect program um, for our next steps. Um, it's gonna be this Friday, same time. Um, so that's where we're going to talk to you about what are those next steps? You've now applied to CSUSB, what do you do next? Um, in terms of admissions, in terms of your to-do list for your financial aid, orientation is going to be there. Um, for any of my first year students, we'll also talk about Coyote First Steps. Um, but we're providing all that programming again to help you make that transition um, a lot easier. So um, okay. we'll have that, that for you as well. Okay, and thank you. And you guys have a wonderful night. I'll still be on and I appreciate everybody else. Olga, there were students requesting information about sociology and social work. Do you want to touch upon those? If not, I can. And I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at the chat, but yes, I'm happy to answer any questions um, as best as I can for any of the other majors. Uh, they just wanted to know any fun facts about social work or sociology, well, and sociology. Um, let's see, so, to the students. let's see, uh, let me see, let me look at some of these. Um, fun facts, social work, that is an impacted major. Uh, that's one of those majors where you have to apply to it as you're transitioning in. Um, so definitely uh, one of those areas that you wanna get a little bit more information about as you're thinking of your majors and declaring it. Um, now for sociology, this is a major that I'm more familiar with. Um, we have, a, ooh, 
Ooh, I was looking at the numbers and, and we're really high up there. Um, but they offer a lot of really wonderful topics, um, you know, in, in different ways of understanding uh, different communities, how different groups and the dynamics work. Um, but a lot of the majors that, that I see are sociology majors and they're just so happy. A lot of really great positive things to say about all the classes in terms of the what you're getting out of it. Um, there's research in sociology. Most of our majors uh, have research as a part of the requirements, um, but all, all of that is led through your faculty members. And um, there's a lot of there's a lot of support for students. Now, I think another question just came in for child development. Stephanie, uh, they're asking if child development is impacted. Yeah, so child development is not impacted, um, but I will say that like some of the other majors, child development actually has a pre-major. And I know there was a question earlier in the chat about pre-major. So with psychology, criminal justice, and child development, um, anybody who applies to those programs, you're automatically admitted as a pre-major. And then you have to complete certain coursework and earn certain EPAs. Um, once you do that, you're automatically converted over to the full major. Social work is a little different. Everybody does also get admitted under pre-major status, but you actually have to formally apply to the program and be accepted in before you can actually get into the full social work major. And they only accept a limited number of students each year for social work. So that one is why it's particularly um, beneficial for students in that program to meet with the faculty members associated with it. Dr. Nick, Nick Watson is great. He, he's readily available to answer any questions you might have about social work. Um, just a couple of things too, because I know somebody asked about criminal justice. Um, criminal justice usually offers a career fair every single year and they bring in, oh, I don't know, it's a large number of agencies. So I think it's usually about 50 or something like that. And for all over uh, Southern California. So I know I've seen from LA County, from OC, obviously from Inland Empire. And it's not just for people that want to do like police officer work or corrections. I mean, it's any type of career that is within the criminal justice system. So even if you wanted to do, I don't know what, I'm not as familiar with criminal justice, but I know it's like if you wanted probably to do dispatch or something like that you if you go to their career fair you can make those connections and networking I mean, because I think part of your college journey here is it's all about networking and not I mean obviously we push for faculty we pushed already for professional advisors but it's also with students I think almost I think all of our departments have student-led clubs sociology in particularly I know they usually have a strong presence within their sociology club there's also the history club there's anthropology club Making those connections with students is also going to be beneficial to you while you're here because they can, they, they're going through the same experience as you and a lot of times you can get tips from them. Now also I do say always take a grain of salt, some things you're getting like save advising for your advisors, but save things like if you have questions about Einstein bagels or just like the little tips and tricks they can help you get through, I mean, peers are also a great resource too. So don't just think about your, you know, academics, that social piece of college is also as much important to you while you're here. And, and I'll do out a shout out to criminal justice because obviously I'm a very proud alumnus of the department is um, they have some of the best faculty. They're actually ranked uh, number fourth in the nation, I believe now, or number three. Um, they're a highly, highly, very, very well-known program um, and we were, you were all talking about centers earlier. One, they have two of the premier centers actually in that department. Uh, one's the Center for Criminal Justice Research, which is very well known and does a lot of work with the federal government. Um, and then uh, I'll put a shout out for the center I help run and that's our Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism, um, which if you ever turn on the news and you see Professor Brian Levin on the news talking about what's going on in America, um, I'm his number two man, and so we run that center and focus on, because that's my area of research is on uh, radicalization, hate, and racism. So, um, so yeah, it's, there's, and that's just two of many different centers. Um, we have an amazing assortment for students to get engaged in our, in our college, and so I highly, highly recommend that. Um, but yeah, criminal justice is amazing. It's gotten better and better. I came there, it was ranked number seven. Um, and it just keeps getting better and better and better. And they do, to Stephanie's point, they bring out federal agencies as well as state agencies. So we've become sort of a pipeline if you do want to go work for the FBI. Uh, we definitely, I have friends who graduate from Cal State with me or work for the FBI now, and Secret Service, and a variety of other agencies. We have really become sort of a major um, 
pipeline for federal jobs in many different agencies throughout the federal government and state government. And we have a few questions about um, social work and being on the wait list. We really can't answer that. Um, that's something that's more uh, direct uh, with the department. You want to save that question for them, okay? Um, we also have, let me see, several questions. And thank you for all the questions. Um, we'll... Olga, really quickly before you move on, because there was a question too about if you don't get admitted in, I believe for all of the impacted majors, usually when you're applying, you have the opportunity to also list like a secondary preference. So you definitely could, um, if you don't get admitted into social work, you could pursue sociology and that would be fine. There's a lot of students that will complete that sociology major and then they'll go on to do um, a master's level degree in social work. So it, they can still keep that option open for them if they want social work. But yes, you could, you could definitely do sociology as a backup. And Stephanie, there was a question about the other way around because we know there's obviously an infamous major on our campus, <laughs> nursing, um, where <laughs> if you don't apply as a certain, one of the impacted majors, um, when you first get in, can you still apply? For example, I'm a political science major, come in as a political science major, but then decide, no, I wanna be a social work major or a psych major, a criminal justice major, can you switch your major into those majors? Uh, yes, you can. So you can definitely switch for, you know, if you're interested in adding psychology or criminal justice, you can even do social work. Um, social work is a little tr trickier though, because like I said, they only do fall admission. So like if you didn't get in this year, you would have to apply to their program for fall of 2022. And it is a two year program to complete. So that could potentially um, extend the time needed to graduate. As far as psychology and criminal justice goes, you could um, switch your major after you start here. But um, if you're a transfer student for both psychology and criminal justice, you do have to complete one term here before you can actually declare them if you did not get admitted into the program directly. Um, like I said, so it all just kind of depends on when you change your mind as the processes that are involved, but those ones you could enter in a little sooner. Stephanie, we have a question about uh, psychology. Um, if you are a transfer and you've done those lower division courses, are you still required to take our introductory class? Uh, so if they are lower level courses, then you do not have to repeat them here. However, I know for psychology particularly, there are plenty of courses at the community college that are the same exact title as ours. For example, abnormal psychology or social psychology. Those courses here are, are upper division requirements for our psychology majors. So if you took them at the community college, you would still have to take them here because you cannot apply a lower division course from the community college towards an upper division requirement here at Cal State. But something like introductory psychology, a lot of the community college will have like research methods, or even if you took biological psychology, those are have um, lower level equivalents here at CSUSB, and they would apply to our major. Uh, or even like developmental psychology, that would also apply to our major. Um, it just can't apply, you can't use a lower level course to apply for something that's upper level here. Now, there is another question. How long does it take to be a clinical psychologist? So I did make a comment uh, earlier in the chat. So technically the term clinical psychologist is reserved for a somebody who has obtained, obtained a doctorate level degree. So either like a PhD in clinical psychology. Um, so for that, you know, depending on your path, I'd say, you know, it could be to do bachelor's. It's usually if you're on the, you know, uh, full load track, it'd be like four years for your bachelor's. And then usually PhD programs are anywhere from about four to five, an additional four to five years, if you go straight back to back. Now, if you do a master's level and PhD, that timeline could be off. Now to practice therapy, if that's ultimately what you wanna do, um, you can practice with a master's level degree and that's depending on the program, master's levels, uh, master's degrees usually take about two to three years. And as I mentioned in the chat, um, in the state of California, you would usually practice under the title of a marriage and family therapist. So, I mean, as far as what you want to do and whether you would want that PhD or the master's would be sufficient, Part of it's gonna depend on what type of duties you want for your career. And part of it will also depend on what populations you wanna work with. So if you wanna do like counseling within like the prison with prison populations, typically, cause that's 
a more specific type of population, you're gonna need more of a PhD level degree as opposed to that master's level degree. But if you want to say practice within a behavioral clinic, you would be sufficient with the uh, master's level degree. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, we have Valerie, why don't you go ahead with your question first and then we'll get back to the chat. Okay, sorry everybody. Um, so my question is different from psychology. I'm actually a child development major as well. Um, I'm not sure if I chose the wrong major. I'm trying to be an elementary school teacher and I did see in the chat that you did answer and say that um, they do have the credentialing program available fall and spring. Am I too late for that since I got admitted as just a child development? No. So for your career path, I mean, you can approach it two different ways. So one, you could do um, liberal studies. That would be a major that could prepare you to do like a credential in multiple subject teaching. Or you could stay with your child development. We have plenty of students that will complete our child development degree. And then what it would be is you would finish our program first and then you would apply. Usually your senior year, you would apply to start the credential program after you graduate. And then that's when you would do your coursework for the multiple subject teaching credential. And depending on the program, um, our program here can be completed, I believe, in one year or two semesters, or you could also even stretch it out um, to do it in three semesters, depending on how quickly you, or how much, how fast pace you want to take your coursework. But yeah, you would be perfectly fine for, if you want to do um, elementary school teaching, you'd probably be best to do the child and adolescent concentration, although ultimately you could do it with either of our concentrations, because like I said, you would have to go on to do that multiple subject credential after your bachelor's degree. Okay. Um, also, aside from this, one of the reasons why I chose San Bernardino um, was because a professor had spoke to me from my community college and told me that there's an option to do credentialing at the same time as getting your bachelor's. Is that incorrect? So that would be correct. But if you wanted to go that route, you'd have to do liberal studies. And I believe it's their integrated track specifically because they have a, a few different concentrations and I'm not as familiar because they're outside of our college, but I'm pretty sure it's their integrated track where it will incorporate some of that credentialing coursework while you're doing the um, their bachelor's level degree. Now, like I said, you could also try to, I know a lot of our students, since I do child development as well, they will meet with the pers the advisor for liberal studies and then they'll also meet with us because liberal studies, um, although it, you do have the benefit of integrating that coursework in, it's also a larger major than child development. So depending on how much coursework you've done in child development, some students still choose to stay with child development because they can graduate sooner, even with it taking a little bit longer for the credential because they can finish our degree faster. So it all is gonna depend on if you have a timeline, like if you have your priority to finish sooner, or like I said, some choose ours anyways, just because they'd rather focus more on that developmental piece when they're doing their bachelor's level degree. So it's kind of gonna be up to you which way you'd want to venture through whether you go liberal studies or us, but either way would work. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, we have a question in the chat, um, and this is a good question. Uh, they're asking, when do you actually sit with an advisor and plan out classes? So um, like they mentioned earlier, we will have next steps and um, during orientation, that's when we have our bigger advising sessions. We break it up by major, explain the major, what format to take the class or what order to take your classes in. Um, but yeah, that would be once you're admitted, okay? Okay, and thank you, Jonathan. You, you answered a question about FBI. Definitely criminal justice. You can, you can go with criminal justice and you would be fine there. Now. So the question I was gonna pose it to Dr. Grisham because the question is really, do you, if you want to become an F or be part of the FBI, do you have to graduate? Um, with your major in criminal justice, or can it be something other than, than criminal justice? It can be something other than criminal justice. Uh, we have a current student who uh, did model UN with me who actually just finished his master's in national security studies and has been uh, hired by the FBI. So, and he was a poli sci major. So, and we've had some from our own department that are doing uh, did a degree in environmental studies, but wanted to do more stuff on environmental like violation, wildlife violations and stuff through the FBI. So the FBI, all they require is a B, is a, a BA plus foreign language. There's certain requirements or a accounting degree. So it's really depends on what you want to do within the FBI itself. Um, 
criminal justice is a more typical route from our campus, but you can definitely do it from almost any major really in our college. I would say outside of our college, it gets tougher. Uh, no disrespect to the other colleges, except maybe in accounting. Uh, they just still like accountants in the FBI. So, uh, but you know, if you're gonna go to get a degree in English, it's, it's probably not gonna help you too much applying to the FBI. So yeah, definitely um, there's more than a few historians that I know who work for the FBI now who got their degrees from our campus. Uh, and then went on to, you know, work in, in those areas. So yeah, you can do it in almost any area. Dr. Grisham, do you know, I don't keep as much on top of it, but I know Dr. Diddy in the College of Business, he used to have a program, I think, with information decision and sciences that was related to FBI work. Yeah, so the, yeah, they still have that program. They've slightly modified it. Um, and also they have uh, the cybersecurity program that is there as well. Um, if you're wanting to do sort of more of the focus on sort of social science and security related issues, I would say definitely go criminal justice or one of our majors. If you want to do more of the technical side for the FBI, then yeah, then, then the college, uh, the Jack Brown School is probably the better fit for some people. And if you want to do, uh, you know, if you want to do uh, analysis work on um, mapping or uh, geospatial intelligence, then definitely contact me. That's our department. We do all of the, GIS is our department. So it's basically for all, but it's open to whatever majors want to do the, the degree program uh, or want to do the minor in GIS, which is new at our campus. Uh, and it's a highly, highly marketable skill regardless of what your major is. Okay, so we just have a few more questions and we're gonna definitely need to wrap it up. We're past time. Um, but, but real quickly, um, we have a question on, do we offer occupational therapy? Now, uh, Stephanie, um, I, I believe we don't have that within our college, am I correct? We do not have that on our campus, um, at least not yet that I'm aware of. Definitely nothing within social and behavioral sciences. But it, like I said um, earlier in the chat, it's, it's very common for, at least I know our psychology students to go on to graduate programs in occupational therapy. Awesome, thank you. Now, um, another question. For, for those that um, they're asking, well, I've been admitted and others are saying, well, I haven't been admitted yet. Um, Jonathan, they once they are admitted, they're gonna be receiving information from your office, correct? Um, not from my office. The Office of Admissions um, is the one that sends out that information. Um, so they will either receive a letter um, or they'll receive an email or both um, congratulating them on their admissions. Um, and those letters will go out all the way up until April, um, the month before your confirmation deposit is due on May 1. But um, they will most likely, unless there's something like really off with your application, um, they will try to get most of the decisions out by, by the month of April. Um, so you should be hearing from them at, at some point between now and, and then. Awesome. Okay, and all right, wonderful. So I think that we got to most of the questions here. Um, I do have one student wanting to stay behind. I'm happy to answer your question. Thank you to everybody who has been here, uh, stayed with us the whole time, to our speakers. We really appreciate everything you have to share with us. And I hope that this gives you all more information about your major, it gets you excited about coming to Cal State. And just know that we're here, we're ready to help and ready to welcome you all for your uh, admission. Thank you guys, it was super helpful. Fantastic, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your help. Absolutely. Hi, Olga. I was the one that asked if I oh, can- Oh, thank you. you. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Thank you so much for all the advice. Um, my question is, how do I go about submitting my transcripts? OK, um, so whatever campus you're at currently, um, at this point, because of, because of COVID, uh, all the campuses are doing the electronic uh, request. So you can request your transcript be sent directly to Cal State. Um, I'm sure you just pay the fees on your end uh, through their website and they will directly forward your transcript to our records office. 
okay, perfect. Because I did go through a website. <laughs> Sorry. Thank <laughs> you. They're all excited to be with me. This is so exciting. And I'm happy that they're here watching you because you got eyes on you, Mama. So you, you guys will be coyotes next. Oh, how exciting. Yeah. You guys are going to be coyotes next? Yeah. Oh, my aunt, not my mom. <laughs> um, but what was I going to say? I did go through a website. I don't remember what it was called. I did pay a fee to send my transcripts to whatever colleges. And I just wasn't sure because on some colleges, it's different. They say to send an email to um, their school admissions email, or some say to do it electronically, like you're mentioning. And I just want to make sure I'm doing it the right way for all the colleges and right. that it gets submitted like before the deadline. Uh, right. So if you're still in classes, you can right. submit the partial transcript. And once those final grades are posted, that's when you want to make that request to have the official finalized transcript forwarded to us. And so do I do that through my current college? Like that's a, a website that they'll, they'll offer? Do you know like, right. what would be under just transcripts probably? Uh, transcript school? request. What school do you go to? Chafee College in Rancho. Chafee. So, um, at Chafee, their office of the registrar, because you have a registrar at your college as well, okay. they usually should have a link that says transcript request or something on their registrar office um, website. And they're very familiar with us. We have a lot of Chafee students that come to us. So they should be able to guide you through. Um, if anything else, and if anything else fails, you could always go to our Next Steps presentation We'll have admissions um, personnel there. Um, we're the, they're the ones that receive it. I say we're, because I used to be part of the Office of Admissions, <laughs> but um, they, I'm no longer part of the Office of Admissions, but um, they're the ones that receive it. Um, and if you have any questions about it, they're the ones that you call um, because they're the ones that scan it into the system and, and um, connect it to your profile. Um, so if they also update your My Coyote, so your My Coyote should also have a section where you can see that we've received oh, your transcripts. Where would um, that be? So sh where that should be in your My Coyote portal in your student center. Student center. And um, sorry, what was the what was the office called that you mentioned that receives the transcripts? The Office of Admissions. Office of Admissions, thank you. So they will say that like, whether they receive them or not, right? Cause I think yes. it's about like two weeks or so until um, it updates, but yeah, that's okay. That's great that you told me that. Cause I was just wondering if they would ever notify me via email or anything. So I will definitely check there then. Yeah, and then you have until July 15th to turn in your final transcripts. And then um, the partial one was already due, like what, two days ago or something like that, right? Yes, I believe in February. Okay. Um, sometime in February is usually when it's due. I think it was February. February. <laughs> I figured since I had I had to go through the process of paying to get them sent, I was like, okay, this is legit. That they probably got them then. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Take care. Yes, stay safe. Thank you as well. Um, can I ask a question too? Absolutely. What's going on? Um, is orientation registration up yet? Registration orientation, I believe, has already opened. Um, let me take a look really quick. Yeah, because I think I did everything else, and I'm looking at the orientation registration, and when I'm reading it, it's talking about 2020. So I just want to make sure it's correct and everything. Or if I should be doing something more. It says for fall 2021, we will open in April. Are you a transfer student? Um, yeah. So it actually says it'll open in March. So you have to come back and check in in March. Okay, um, awesome. So that, that is when it'll open. Just remember, you do need to accept your offer of admissions and pay your enrollment confirmation deposit to, to register. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure I already did that. Awesome. You should receive an email from the um, first year in orientation office to let you know when the orientation registration is opened up. Um, but I know transfer orientation doesn't start until the end. I think it's like the last week in April. 
But awesome. when you yeah. get that email, I would definitely recommend that you register right away because it's better to do the first or, you know, the earliest orientation session as, as possible. Yes. Yeah, that's why I was asking now because I heard a lot that like, yeah, it fills up super quick. You wanted to make that the first thing you do. Yes. Yeah, so just periodically check back in March. We, sh we will be sending out an email. Um, so I'm part of the orientation team. So emails should be sent out, but it takes some time to set up the portal and stuff. So that's why it'll take us some time to open it. That's why we don't specify which day in March. We just say March. Um, so just give us some time to, to play around in that portal and, and set it all up for you all. Okay, thank you so much. You're all right. welcome. Thanks for being here. Kaylin or Daisy, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so I know psychology is very impacted. Is there any way if like I could still like get accepted like into a different um, program? Go ahead, Stephanie. Well, when you say get accepted, like, so you mean if you don't end up getting admitted to psychology, could you do a different major? Is that your question? Yes. Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, for any of the programs that are impacted, I would uh, I would highly recommend that when you, if you, I don't know, I think because you might have already applied, if you did, you, sh you had the opportunity to specify like a, a secondary program in the event that you don't get admitted into that first choice. If you didn't, I think you can, I believe you could still contact the admissions office and, and add on your secondary option. Um, but yes, I would definitely say that because as, as we mentioned earlier, if you don't get admitted you know, upon the initial evaluation of your coursework, there is still potential for you to add it later on. Or you could, depending on what you want to do career-wise, you could always do like something like sociology or another major within social sciences and still pursue the career that you are interested in. Because oftentimes with psychology, you do have to get um, master's levels degrees to practice within our field. Um, so you could always get you know, your bachelor's degree in sociology, but then go on for a master's level degree in psychology. Um, okay, also, um, hang on, I'm sorry. Um, would arts and humanities be good? No, I would say, I mean, if you don't get into psychology, I mean, it depends on what you wanna do, but if you are interested in, like you said, something like therapy or counseling, I would say it's better to at least keep it within the social sciences. Um, okay. like for example, as Olga mentioned, sociology, they have a lot of courses that kind of correspond with our field. I know they for sure have, like, I think it's the sociology of mental illness, and that would be a great one for you. Um, they have, like, I think it's social psychology or I forget the title under sociology, something like that, but they have coursework that more relates to psychology. I mean, you could still, you don't have to do it within social sciences. You could still get like a philosophy degree and go to a psychology graduate program, but I think it's the content would be more beneficial if you at least kept it in the social sciences. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. And Daisy, I'll add that when you get your letter of admission, that you actually look at the major that you got admitted to because sometimes we will just do it automatically the office of admissions if you don't get admitted to psychology and their requirements <clears throat> or their to their pre-psych major they'll automatically reconsider you for that second major that you indicated in your application and they'll admit you there so you might be you might get your admissions there and think you're in psychology but it'll say you've been admitted to this major this program so make sure you check it so you understand which um, major you actually got admitted to. And there's always an appeal process if, if you get denied for, for um, the psych major and you didn't indicate a second major, um, there'll be an appeal process for you to, to appeal the decision and add a second major. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. I think we just have Kaylin. Do you have a question? No. You're muted, Olga. 
Of course, right? She uh, she was just saying that um, she was just listening in on that last information. So thank you for being with us. That concludes our presentation.